when the soul never dies, my life will lead to that fair land where the soul never dies. My there will be no parting hand where the soul never dies, no sad farewells, no tear dimmed eyes, where all is love and the soul never dies. Thank you. You may be seated. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is that you have prepared a place for us. What a blessing it is that we can have your spirit in our lives today. You are with us now and you will be with us in heaven. We thank you and, and praise your name. Father, we pray that you will be with us this hour, that we will think about the words that we sing, hear the words that are spoken, hear your words from your Holy Scripture. We're thankful for you being with us. You sent your Son to be God with us. We pray that you will be with all those that serve today. We pray that you be with Chris as he brings us a lesson. Father, we pray that we are not merely hearers, but doers of your word. Work in our lives. We pray that the Spirit directs us, speaks to us, and guides us. Father, we're thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our salvation. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thou art holy, 
Thank you, Tyler. All right, I'm going to start with a slide. There is a reason that's up there. This is kind of what I felt like on Friday. And I'll put the, that's, that's enough of that. So if you look at the bulletin, you can see the title of the sermon is The Lord Who Sanctifies. It's another one of the names of God, Jehovah Mekadesh, and it's the Lord who sanctifies. But I'm not preaching that sermon yet. I changed it on Friday. <laughs> I know that's a scary thought, isn't it? Uh, the lesson on the name of God, this name of God, Jehovah uh, Mekadesh or Mekadesh, it depends on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, it's, it's very foundational to, to a lot of the things we want to talk about coming up. And so I was going to do two sermons on it, which is not a problem, except that next week we start into March on, into missions. And during all of March, we'll be having presentations on the mission works that we are partnering with. Next week, we're going to have Kent Markham here to talk about Ecuador. Uh, then on March 14th, we'll hear about the work in Zambia. Uh, March 21st, we'll be on the, the Africa Christian College work, Eswatini. And, uh, and the last Sunday, the 28th, will be Lanny. Uh, Tucker from Eastern European Mission. So I decided not to do one lesson on the Lord who sanctifies and then wait until April to do the next one. Instead, and maybe this is more appropriate, uh, I'll give some thoughts to hopefully help us focus on what we're going to be doing in terms of being mission-minded. And I'm going to just jump right into an Old Testament text. And I referenced it before, but it's certainly good to revisit and if you want to open your Bibles, uh, we're going to have a lot of verses to talk about, but only a few to read, but we're going to go through the, the story. It's in 2 Kings, actually. 2 Kings chapter 6 into chapter 7. It starts with verse 24. And uh, we'll talk about some of this, but give a little background. Here, we're during the time of the divided kingdom. And uh, Israel was suffering at the hands of their enemies. Elisha is the prophet of God. But like we find so often, the people have not been listening to him, which means they've not been listening to God. And really, this is, this is an extraordinary passage because it describes horrible suffering in the city of Samaria. And in our text, the Arameans are the enemy. Some of your translations may say Syrians. It goes both ways. And they had laid siege to the city of Samaria in Israel. And... But I have to warn you, some of this is pretty graphic, and I'm going to just touch on it as quickly as I can. But it's a, uh, this famine, uh, the siege is described in graphic terms. This famine is serious. It's a terrible famine that's gripped the city. And, and prices for food have just skyrocketed. And there's some pretty unappetizing things here that people are willing to eat. One is they're willing to eat the head of a donkey and dove's dung. Now, this kind of hunger, really, this is starvation. That's foreign to us. But here in 2 Kings, this is a picture of absolute desperation. And the text tells us that the king was walking the wall of the city, meaning I think he was, he was walking around, maybe, I don't know, looking at their situation, looking at his defenses, wondering what he's going to do. And while he was walking the wall, a woman cried out to him. And she literally cried out in desperation to the king to help her. And he responded by telling her, basically I think he said, there's nothing I can do about all this mess we're in. He told her, let the Lord help you. And we've been doing the names of God. It's in capital letters. Let Yahweh help you. But I think maybe he felt some pity because he did relent. And he went ahead and he asked her, you know, what she wanted. And he got the shock of his life. And the horror of this famine comes home to us in these verses because things had gotten so bad, at least some of the people were devouring their children. Cannibalism. And this is God's own people. And this woman was upset when she came to the king. She had shared her son with her friend, but then her friend went and hid her son and wouldn't do the same. And I was reading through this Friday, and I don't know what to do with this. I don't think 
any of us would certainly do this, even under these circumstances. And we have famines and starvation in the world today. We see people who desperately try to take care of their children first and would never do something like this. This is a horror I really can't fathom. And I have to say, I don't know this kind of hunger and despair. Those are the questions come to mind, but I think there's a better one. The real question here is, what does God want us to see? What is God showing us? In this text, we see a people who have totally, completely removed themselves from God's presence. And not just from God's presence, from his entire moral realm. And not only were they suffering physically, they were especially suffering spiritually. Their lives were reduced to pretty much living like animals, and they were doing things that a lot of animals don't do. And the king, when he heard what she said, he was absolutely beside himself. And he tore his coat. He ripped his clothes. That was a sign in the ancient world. We know what, what that is. We've read the text before. When someone does that in the ancient when they did that in the ancient world, I don't know, maybe they do it today, but when you ripped your garments, that was a sign of extreme anguish and distress. And then, when you read those verses there, and you can look at it, he blamed Elisha, God's prophet for the famine. If it's the same king Jehoram, and it it probably is, it might not be, but it probably is the same king that we see earlier in the book. He seems to have trusted Elisha, but now he wants to kill him. And this may be because he saw Elisha, really it was God, but he saw Elisha work great miracles when Israel faced the dreaded Arameans before. But now the city is about to starve at the hands of the Arameans. Maybe the king thought Elisha had failed. Maybe he didn't have his connection with God. Maybe he wasn't calling on God enough. And then eventually when you read the text, eventually the king went so far as to blame God for Israel's woes. Look at at his statement. Why should I hope in the Lord Yahweh any longer? And I don't think Jehoram made any kind of connection between Israel's moral bankruptcy and the situation they were in. They'd abandoned God. And when people abandon God, they fill that void that only God can fill. And they fill it with all kinds of evil. And they became the very opposite of what God intended his people to be. They were supposed to teach their children about God, instilling into them who God is, who they were supposed to be, And the women in these verses, they had definitely abandoned God. They had abandoned their children. Instead of teaching them, they they were trying to consume them. This This is terrible sin in Israel. And I think we're supposed to read this text and be shocked. And maybe a question should come to mind. Why would God save them? Why should he? That was then. What about our world now? What about today? What about the spiritual condition of our world and so many in our world? And I bring this up, just things that are swirling around us because we are getting hammered with this every day. We're being bombarded every day with this. Our children are being bombarded with this message in a lot of our schools that there's no such thing as men and women. You can choose whichever you want to be. It's up to you. And this has led to all kinds of sad confusion and pain. And there are a lot of tragic stories out there over this. And again, we see the death of so many of the unborn. And there is so much disrespect of others. In fact, there's hatred, and it's on all sides. It's everywhere, not just one. And there's the degrading of others. People abuse one another. Our values, we see any godly values are beginning to erode more and more. Too many people have the attitude, what I want now is all that matters, and no one else really does. And it's an understatement to say that in our culture and in our world, God is basically ignored, at least by a lot of people. And I think we are becoming more acutely aware of the spiritual famine that is in our world today. It's always been there, but I think we're seeing it more clearly now. We have been besieged by our own culture, which ultimately is Satan. That's who's doing it. And every culture is facing it and always has. And what do people in our world culture need? Has God 
turned his back on our world? Well, we already know the answer, but we can find an answer in our text this morning. Did God turn his back on his people in 2 Kings? And the answer is no. 2 Kings chapter 7, look at verse 1. But Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time a measure of choice meal shall be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Then the captain on whose hand the king leaned said to the man of God, Even if the Lord were to make windows in the sky, could such a thing happen? But Elisha said, You shall see it with your own eyes. There's more to that story, but we won't get into that as far as this messenger. But Elisha told the king's messenger that by the next day there would be food in the city. The prices would be back to normal. He was saying the crisis is going to pass. And that's pretty amazing considering that the great army of Ben-Hadad, the Aramean, was about ready to devour the city and destroy them all. But the prophet had spoken. Actually, God had spoken and God had not abandoned his people. And we see God's amazing compassion here, His amazing grace. But then we look a little further in chapter 7, and new characters come on the scene. There's this big shift here. Good news for God's people is about to come through some of the most unlikely characters. There were four Leprous men living outside the city gate. We talked about lepers before, but their plight, it was horrible. There was terrible physical suffering with this disease. It completely just destroyed a person's life. And if a person contracted leprosy, they were not only looking at terrible physical suffering and ultimately death, they were also looking at losing their livelihood, losing their possessions, losing their families. It was a devastating disease. In Leviticus 13 we're told that lepers were commanded to live outside the city, away from others. They were told to quarantine. That's a word we're much more familiar with now than we were a year ago, aren't we? But that was for stopping the spread of the disease. And if they did happen to come in contact with others, they had to shout, unclean, unclean, so that people would stay away for the benefit of others. And the people in Israel had come to make this disease something personal and they came to believe that it wasn't the disease that made you unclean you were unclean in and of yourself as a person you were unclean you'd been condemned by God you were of no value and I'm pretty sure that these men received no compassion from their brother and sister Israelites from the city of Samaria and with the famine in the city there was no hope for these people before the famine, they might have had a few family members who would come out and bring them food. That's usually the only way they survived. But with this siege, I'm sure that they were forgotten men. So they decided they had nothing to lose. They decided to go over to the Aramean camp. And here's what they were thinking was, you know, hey, maybe by some stroke of luck, the Arameans, they'll have some pity on us, give us a little food. And even if the Arameans kill us, well, we're dead already. And so they went to the Aramean camp. And an amazing thing had happened. They found the Aramean camp completely deserted. A whole army was gone, and they left everything behind. Verse 6 says, For the Lord had caused the Aramean army to hear the sound of chariots and of horses, the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, The king of Israel has hired the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to fight against us. And an army of thousands left all their clothes, their tents, their gold, their food. And the lepers ate and drank all that they wanted. They began to take and hide the clothes, the gold, the silver, as much as they could carry off. It was an incredible amount of stuff for four people. It would have been more than enough of them for the rest of their lives, however short that might have been. And they may have been suffering from leprosy, but they were going to suffer in style. There would never be any lepers who lived like these lepers. And actually, when you look at it, why shouldn't they just take care of themselves? The people in the city, a siege was their problem. It's not the lepers' problem. Why should they care about these people in the city? They had done and were doing nothing for them. Why should they care about a world that basically hated them? 
but they did care. And they cared because they had great respect for God. They actually had more respect for God than the people in the city did. In verse 9, Then they said to one another, What we're doing is wrong. This is the day of good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light, we will be found guilty. Therefore, let us go and tell the king's household. So they came and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, We went to the Aramean camp, but there was no one to be seen or heard there, nothing but the horses tied, the donkeys tied, and the tents. They're there. Well, the king... He sent out messengers to see whether or not what the leper said was true. And it was. The crisis was over. God had mercy on his people. But how did God send word about this great mercy? He didn't shout in a thunderous voice from heaven. He didn't even send word through Elisha, although Elisha had basically said it before. It would happen. But he left it up to four lepers who had found the greatest treasure they'd ever seen. And they could have kept it to themselves, but they knew that would be wrong. And they did feel a responsibility to the people suffering in the city. And here's what's so important. They identified with the suffering of the people in the city. And just as they wanted to be free from their circumstances, they wanted the people of Samaria to, to be free from their circumstances. They didn't want them to suffer anymore. This news was just too good to keep to themselves. It's like Terry Fretheim says in his book on 2 Kings. He said, here were the little people shaping Israel's future. People at the bottom. They're the ones who God chose to deliver good news about deliverance. They were sharing what God had given them. And I think it's pretty obvious where we can go with this text. We can't just sit on the good news of God. We are like lepers who've been saved by God. As Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. Will we share with others who are starving to hear the message of God's love and sacrifice for us? A lot of people may not want it, but a lot do. <clears throat> Will we tell others about the only thing in life that matters? When we understand how much God loves us, when we truly see the cross and the riches God gives us, how can we keep it to ourselves? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we get caught up in so many different things. And sometimes churches get caught up in things. We do. We get busy. <coughs> and we do a lot of, quote, church things. And it's easy to get caught up in things that might be good in and of themselves, but may not be focused totally on the continuation of the work Jesus began in his earthly ministry. I like what one person said. said, in the Great Commission, the Lord has called us to be like Peter, fishers of men. We've turned the commission around so that we have become merely keepers of the aquarium. Occasionally I take some fish out of your fish bowl and put them into mine, and you do the same with my bowl, but we're all tending the same fish. Hmm. When Jesus called his disciples to be fishers of men, fishers of people, they were to bring others to him. And the call hasn't changed. But it's not simply a duty or obligation that should motivate us, although that's enough if God has commanded it. But conviction, passion should be there. It, it should be like the apostles in Acts chapter 4 when they stood before the council and they made the statement, for we cannot uh, keep from speaking about what we've heard and what, what we've seen and what we've heard. And we need to think about the fact that we have riches beyond measure. And I've used this verse several times the last few weeks, but 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Paul says, for you know the generous, oh, what a, I don't think he can come up with a better word. But for you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. He says Jesus became poor. And it wasn't just in this earthly life, although Jesus experienced earthly poverty. Paul is talking about what he tells us in Philippians 2. 
Jesus gave up the glory of existing in the very form of God to become human. Not just any kind of human, he became a slave. And he died, and not the death of, or not just any kind of death, but death on a cross. That's the greatest description of someone choosing poverty in the universe. But in his poverty, climaxing in the cross and resurrection, we become rich. We share in the riches of God. We have had salvation lavished upon us. That's the word the book of Ephesians uses when it talks about God's grace. His salvation has been lavished upon us. And it's the only treasure worth anything. And as someone once said, all, all we are are beggars showing other beggars where the bread is. I like that statement. You know, in Acts 26 and 29, making his defense before King Agrippa, Paul said, I pray to God that not only you, but also all who are listening to me today might become such as I. And he meant free in Christ. That should be the desire for ourselves, for those in our community, all across the world. We're coming into march into missions, and we will be hearing about marvelous things that God is doing around the world, and that should thrill us. It's not just those works. There are all kinds of works out there God is doing. We're just, we're just this tiny little part of it. And yes, our world is a mess. Always has been. But just like in 2 Kings, even though the world is a mess and sometimes even God's people, God loves our world, loves us deeply. And God wants us to love the lost deeply. He wants us to have a love for the lost people in Ecuador, Africa, Eastern Europe, all the nations, in our own community, our neighbors. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. I think we want to keep that in mind and think on those things uh, these next few weeks as we, we listen to these presentations about uh, the works that we are partnering with and as we prepare to support those works and as we begin to think about how we can live it out in our own communities. This morning, that's our ending point, and we have an invitation song. And always, the invitation of God is always there, but this is a special time if you like prayers of the church. Uh, we're certainly available to do that. If you want to put Christ on in baptism, we're ready for that always. If we can help you in any way, we would invite you to come as we stand together and as we sing. Mm. Oh, wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. Oh, wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love, and me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, he taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up, and I shall
is transported, I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. You may be seated. morning, church family. It's interesting that Chris uh, mentioned Peter in his message, being fishers of men. I was reading Peter last night when I was looking for uh, something to say this morning before we do communion. So I'm going to start in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. <clears throat> Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like gold, like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but with, was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. This group of passages is all about um, the precious lamb, the blood that was shed. Verse 23, it talks about being judged by a father who is perfect in his judgment, which is hard for me to understand, but no matter what the judgment will be, it will be perfect. And he judges our actions. If you look at verse 17, Judges according to each one's works. Our salvation is secure in Christ and in the gift and in the grace. But we're judged by what we do. By who we choose to be. It talks about being redeemed. When we purify our souls by obeying the truth. The easy the easy truth, the gospel, the good news. This morning, think about what you do each and every day for the Lord. Are you taking the joy of the good news to those around you? This is a time of self-reflection. It's about a perfect father, a perfect son, a perfect love, and a perfect plan for us as being imperfect. Will you pray with me? 
Our Father in heaven, we thank you this morning so much for your perfectness, for the perfect son that was sent, for his perfect body that was broken on the cross for us. Father, this morning as we think about these things and about who we are each and every day, help us to reflect on Christ and on your perfect plan. We ask your blessing on the bread this morning and each one of us as we partake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our Father in heaven, we come to you again in prayer, thanking you for the, the, the life that came out of Christ in the form of his blood. We recognize the significance to you, Father, in the blood, how it's always meant life, physically and spiritually. We ask now your blessing on the fruit of the vine, which represents that shed blood for us. We thank you so much, Father, for the gift of his blood and the salvation that we find in it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. really good to see, you know, kind of more and more people coming back and joining us in person for worship, uh, so we're really glad all of you are here today with us. I have just a couple of announcements. Um, we are tentatively scheduling a clothing giveaway for the 24th of April, so you can bring clothes uh, here to the building and put them in the room next to the kitchen. And they will need help in sorting clothes on Friday the 23rd if you don't want to come in contact with others. And then on Saturday, April 24th at the giveaway. You can contact members of the outreach team, uh, Mary Beth, me, Tammy, Brad, or Cheryl Wilson uh, with questions if you can help with that. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, next week we will begin March into Missions and we'll have Kent Markham with us here. And so we look forward to that. Also have a note uh, from Mary Beth uh, asking that we continue in prayer for Karen Chisholm. Uh, her husband Greg was a minister here many years ago. Uh, she has fought bone cancer for over 12 years and has decided to stop treatment and so is on hospice. She's faithful, she's ready, and we just uh, need to pray that she's comfortable and that her children are prepared. So let's uh, close our today with prayer. Father in heaven, we do recognize you as God, as, as Lord, as King in our lives. Uh, we want to follow you. We want to uh, dedicate ourselves to you. We thank you for the blessing that is the salvation that we receive because of Jesus. And we pray that you will help us as we take that message uh, through our lives, the message of salvation, the message of grace, the good news, uh, and as we live our lives according to it, and as we share it with others. But we also recognize that you have the power to heal. And we have several congregation or 
or loved ones of those in the congregation who uh, need your healing power. And we want to uh, pray for that this morning. We pray, Father, for uh, the sailor's son-in-law, Nick Saggart, and the terrible migraines that he's going through. We pray that you will lift that from him um, and that he will get relief from that. We continue to pray for Lorraine's sister, Gaynell, and the recovery from the stroke that she's going through, and we pray that you will bless her in that. We also pray, Father, uh, for Laureen this morning. We pray that you will be with her uh, and that you will give her relief from the dizzy spells that she's been suffering this week. Uh, be with her as she goes to the doctor this week, and we pray that there will be some solution to that. We also pray uh, that you will be with Marilyn, uh, who is also not feeling well this morning. We continue uh, to pray with Sherry Davis for her friend Stacy, uh, who is um, in, in pretty bad shape with cancer, and we just pray that you will uh, give him hope and give him courage. Father, we also continue uh, in, pray, in, in prayer for um, Eileen Moak's son, Tim Fox, and leg infection that is uh, bothering him uh, and the diabetes that is complicating that infection. We pray for healing. We pray for uh, just some resolution of that for him. Uh, we praise you for news about her granddaughter, Brandy McMullen, and that the biopsies uh, that we prayed about last week came back negative. And we pray that you will be with her as she deals with whatever um, health issues that she has. But we're very grateful that uh, it is not cancer. We do continue to pray for Norman John's nephew, Jimmy, and as he does uh, deal with cancer in his body. We pray that he will get good treatment. We pray, again, just for healing for him. We are grateful that Judy LaFond has finished her quarantine and that she did not uh, get the, the uh, virus, uh, the, the disease associated with the virus. Um, so we are, we are grateful for the protection that you gave her. Father, we pray for uh, Betty Treadway and, and the extreme back and leg pain that she is uh, suffering. We pray that you will give her relief from that. Uh, we know that she's under the care of doctors and uh, perhaps they will find something, uh, but we know uh, that you are the one ultimately gives healing and pray for that for Betty. And then we do pray for Karen Chisholm, Father, that you will uh, be with her um, who has been faithful to you all of her life and who is now ready to uh, make the passage from this life into the next. And we pray that you will be with her, that you will give her peace, that you will keep her comfortable during that, during that passage. And we also pray for her children, uh, that they will be uh, ready and, and uh, that they uh, can just uh, be with her and provide comfort and strength for her as she goes through this. Father, we are grateful for um, who uh, dedicate their, their lives to um, the sharing of your gospel in various places around the world. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have to partner with some of those. And we look forward to um, celebrating that and, and learning more about those works in the coming weeks as we go into the March into Missions time. We pray that you will be with us as we uh, rededicate ourselves to these works. And now, Father, we pray that you will uh, be with us through your spirit, that your spirit will give us uh, strength, uh, the 
that your spirit will give us um, strength against temptation and guide us as we uh, make decisions and, and uh, move through our lives this week. We pray for that blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we are dismissed.